You go. Hello, found I'm Robin. I'm a real alcoholic. I want to welcome everyone to the Land of Stepho Society's book study. Change your thinking, change your life. Let's open with a moment of silence, followed by the serenity prayer. <laughs> serenity prayer? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. All right, we're going to go right into the study tonight, but I want to um, thank Elsa week four last. I didn't see her last week, and she came up here, and I listened to the CD a lot, two, two times in my uh, car, and you did an excellent job, so I just want to commend you on that. All right, so we're going to start on 125. We're in the chapter, the family afterwards. This is after the alcoholic has returned home, and he's clean. You know, he's been freed for the addiction. But as we all know, it's, um, it's not an instant cleanness. You know what I'm trying to say? It's still a lot of work you got to do once you get back in the family. You still have to, uh, let's say, cover that or a heal. So we're going to go over a few chapters tonight to see what happens after you get home. And we're going to start down at the bottom with... Uh, well, it says another principle we observe carefully. All right, Paul. Another principle we observe carefully is that we do not relate intimate experiences of another person unless we are sure he would approve. We find it better, when possible, to stick to our own stories. A man may criticize or laugh at himself, and it will affect others favorably. But criticism or ridicule coming from another often produces a contrary effect. Members of a family should watch such matters carefully, where one careless, inconsiderate remark has been known to raise the very devil. We alcoholics are sensitive people. It takes some of us a long time to outgrow that serious handicap. <laughs> All right, another principle. Remember, a principle is something like the basic truth or basic truthful theory. It has truth in it. Right? And you can take the principle and you can kind of judge whether you're right or you're wrong. You know, you can make a choice. But the principle usually stays the same. Uh, I was telling folks earlier, and we're going to get in that in a minute, but I always, in my life, I use the farming principle. The farming principle. And I'm just going to give you an example of a principle, a law. The farming principle is, you know what, you like to go out and you plant a farmer? Well, the farming principle is you plant at a certain season, right? And it grows in a certain season, right? Am I right? You're a farmer, right? Then you reap it, you get the product out at a certain season, and then winter comes, and it kind of dies off. It goes to sleep, and you start the process over in season. So my thing is, in spring, if I want to, if I use the farming technique, I'll plant tomatoes like now. Hurry up and get them out. They should have been out a little earlier than now because the, the heat going to burn when they come up little. Right in the beginning, right after it, from what I was always told, is right out the Good Friday, right? That's when you put them in the ground. No frost going to come and this and that, supposedly. And then they'll grow. Then you got fall, uh, uh, right? And then the next thing you know, right before winter, you take it out, or right before fall. But the bottom line is, I'm not a good farmer. But I do know it's done with patience, All right? You plant, you let it grow, you water and let the sun come, then you reap it, then it goes to sleep, and it starts over every year. A farmer, understands the principle of nature, how it works. You can control a lot of stuff, but you ain't gonna be able to control them seasons. That's a power greater than you if you're a farmer. You're not gonna be able to control the rain, the amount of rain, you know, you might cover them up or something, but you're not gonna be able to control how hot it is. You gotta go into man-made thinking to do this. But the natural law is the same. The season gonna be basically the same, all right? Now, you can't 
a law is different from man-made law like my law. Uh, one of my laws in in I was using like when I was in college, I crammed a lot. <laughs> you know, right before a test. Now, uh, if, if uh, one college class when I was going to school was two to three months. I think we had quarters or semesters. Right? It wasn't condensed like it is now. I see a lot of condensed stuff. But they were long. Alright? So, now, I wasn't going to study no book, no three months, and then take different tests. I find out what day the test going to come. I pick up the book two days or the night before, and I go to cram it. And by me being an excellent career drinking and, and drugger, I would take pills and alcohol to help me cram. That's what I did. Perkadam was a good one. So I would cram, and then I'd take the test, and everything I learned, I forgot. Right when I walked out the, 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 the room. You know, and I start for the next one. I look on the day, when the next day, for two weeks away, I can party. I knew I had down to a science when to start studying. Now, can you go to college and not learn anything? Yes. yes. And get a degree. Yes. Don't learn nothing. <laughs> That's a cramming student. But that was not the principle or the truth of college. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? Right. I just had my own man-made thinking to get through college. But they really wanted you to have a nice, solid education a nice, solid brain that was matured and be able to think in the real world and all that. All I learned how, how to do was crash and get past it and crash again. So I didn't follow the principle of basic education or higher education. Anybody, and what, what I'm trying to say is you cannot go back into a farming, you can't take the laws or the principles of farming and apply a crashing for plants. It just won't work. So the universal laws, that's what we teach in here. If you follow the laws, you'll be okay. If you got your own program, it's like a crash course. And you're going to forget everything you learned and you're going to relapse. So it said right here, Another principle we observe carefully is that we do not relate intimate experiences of another person unless we are sure he will approve. If you have to tell something that's personal or something like that, just talk about yourself. <coughs> Don't go out and, you know, in the room we say only discuss what you said. Don't tell what someone else said. If you really want to know what they said, you come in the room and you hear for yourself. So in the family, they said, don't go out discussing other intimate situations about other people. Just talk about yourself. Then they go further. They said, we find it better when possible to stick to your own stories. I found, you know, when I first started studying the book, I've been teaching this book like over 20 years, right at 20, 20, 20 and a half years. But when I first started, I wasn't able to break it down like this. It's come with experience. What I was doing was just reading the book, the chapter, and then saying, anybody want to share? And then they share something and I comment. But I would study before, but I didn't have what I have now, and I'm pretty sure if I did it for another 20 years, I'll be looking back at this night and say I didn't have what I have then, you know, because between each each year I lived and I experienced more, and when I get back to the book, I was able to understand more because I had experienced more. I had more life in it. But I wasn't nowhere, I wasn't even telling my story. I didn't have a story to tell, unless it was a drunk law. I hadn't experienced much. So, you know, a lot of people say, well, I would like to, I only want to uh, be there with Robert do it. Well, if that's the way you feel, maybe you need to start your own. Because that way, you can get yourself in here and get in there for yourself. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, by me talking and sticking to my own stories, that's what I evolved. In other words, the book became alive in me 
because I was open enough to allow to, to put myself in the book. It became alive in me. So when I do a class now, something like that, I try to make it alive. I try to, to bring my best out so everybody can like get a better understanding. But really, I'm only talking about me. I'm ready. This is my class or my uh, fellowship hour for myself. Y'all just happen to be fortunate enough to hear me share about myself. But really, it's for me too. That makes sense? Yeah. It's really for me. Because I, I see myself in here. And I see, and I'm talking about, when I say myself, I'm talking about my world. Mm -hmm. My family, the company, my relationship with everybody else. It's all, it's all in here. I see it in here. All right? So it, it allowed me to, the book to come alive in me by talking about myself. A man may criticize or laugh at himself, and it will affect others favorably. If I'm talking about myself, what you call him does a great do job at that. Uh, the little short comedian, um, Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. Yeah. Kevin Hart is the professional donor about himself. <laughs> And he is a hit right now. He's on every new movie that come out. He's a hit. And I, I, Oprah asked him, I seen him on Oprah. She asked him, you have always, how did you handle being so short from people talking about you or saying things about you? How did you get past that? He said, I beat them to the punch. I would talk about myself first before they got an opportunity to talk about me. So by me beating them, when I talked about myself, they couldn't do nothing but laugh at it. And that's how he evolved. He talked about himself first. That makes sense? He's a professional at that. He took short people syndrome to another level. You know? And I think that was real genius of him. He didn't have to be hurt and, and, and cry and, and run around and feel sad. Because he talked about himself first. All right? But criticism or ridicule coming from another produces the contrary effect. If I hear, I'm going to tell you when my first, first real AA effect that was contradicted to everything that we talk about. It was when my, my mother got a phone call. Yeah, I got a phone call from my mother saying that my sister and her husband had broke up. I think I told this story before. They had broke up. And I thought they had a happy marriage. They were getting a divorce. I was, in, I was uh, just coming out of St. Jude's. I had about a year clean. I had a little apartment. I was sitting in my apartment. It was July, I remember that, and uh, I lived in this little apartment complex, one with three buildings, and it had a, a square down in the middle with grass and stuff, where, and the, the apartments were having, uh, somebody downstairs was having a big party out there, and they were like, drinking and having a lot of noise, and they had loud music and everything, they were having a good time. But I was up in my apartment, and my mother called me and said that my sister and my brother-in-law was getting a divorce. And in his anger and rage, he was talking about my sister. Negative stuff. Now, my mother, that's what she do. If something's going to be negative, you're going to hear about it. So, you know what I'm talking about, Ron. <laughs> so, after that, she was talking about what he was saying about my sister. Then she jumped to my brother. She said what he said was negative about him. Then she jumped to my other brother, and I, what he said negative about him. I said, well, you know, I'm in the program now, an honest program. I said, well, what he's saying is true. I can see that, too. I'm in recovery. I see that. She said, oh, hold up. Let me tell you what he said about you. <laughs> Wait a minute, he ain't supposed to say nothing about me. I'm so righteous. I got a year clear. I picked up my chip. And nah, he said, you a drunk, you a hobo, and you would never, ever, Stay clean and sober. You just taking them people time and wasting their time. You will never be able to do it. You're gonna always be an alcoholic to the day you die. That's what he said about me. When I say come in the room and I talk about alcoholism with y'all, it's okay. Y'all laugh with me. We all giggle, giggle. But to hear from him, 
and my mother said that, and he said that about me, that hurt me. That hurt me. That wasn't funny. You know what I'm trying to say? When somebody else was calling me an alcoholic, I'm going to die in alcoholism, I didn't take that funny. Mm -hmm. If I would have said if I kept using that, 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 that all y'all would have laughed. But when he said it, it hurt. i never forget what happened. I said, I had to do something about the pain. I sat down on the side of my bed, and I had that little big old, you know how they had the big old phone then? They were wireless, but they were huge. I set it on the phone, they were rocking like a banana. You know the one. I set it down, right? And my mother was still talking. I said, man. I, I thought, I, I, I went back to, I remember something about Peter denying Jesus. You know what I'm saying? And I said, wow, he denied Jesus. This is like, I'm like Peter now, to deny recovery. Because I told my mother, he's a liar. I ain't no alcoholic. He's a liar. And I caught myself. Only thing I can do, she was still talking. I went over to the, to my sliding glass door where they were having all that noise. And I stood on my porch. And I said, yo, yo, real loud. Everybody down there, cut the music off. I got something important to tell you. They looked up at me. <laughs> I said, turn the music off. I got something important to tell y'all. They said, what you want? I said, I am a recovering alcoholic. I was an alcoholic, but I'm no longer using no more. I'm free. I was, and my brother-in-law called me a drunk, but I have approved because I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not going to die in no damn gutter from being drunk. I am recovering. <laughs> All them people down there were halfway they were like one of them too. <laughs> and what they did, they clapped. But I, I felt good. I had to tell myself again that I'm in recovery and I used to be an alcoholic. Once I told myself again, you know what I'm trying to say? That's when I felt myself being free. So if you kind of like, we don't have to defend ourselves no more, we can laugh at ourselves. That's where the freedom comes. All right? People, when I, when I was real big, people would say, oh, you fat. I used to, that used to offend me a long time. Then I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to buy me some real nice clothes. Real nice, nice, nice. I, bought, I started buying better clothes. You know what I'm trying to say? Better shirts, better pants, better shoes, nicer haircut. Oh, you fat. Fat and clean, though. <laughs> 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 now I ain't for real. Now you skinny here and dirty, but I'm fat and clean. So, you know, uh, and when I start, like, you know, on, like recycling mm -hmm. it in myself, I start feeling better. Because I ain't got to, I can't got to, I can't go around and let other people uh, judge me and put me down. You know what I'm trying to say? Make me feel bad. I had to come back with something. And, and, and that works. You know? It says, Members of a family so watch such matters carefully. For one careless, inconsiderate remark has been known to raise the very devil. Sometimes you need to watch what you say about other people. I've been around people that have the foulest mouth. Just say bad things about their own family people. You know what I'm trying to say? And it just, like, I would just shake my head. Now, I've been fortunate enough to be, I myself was raised in a family. We pretty respectful toward each other, you know what I'm saying? Like my brother and I, we were three years apart. He died when he was 50, and I was 53, you know. But I, we only had one, one argument our whole life. One. I think that's remarkable. You know what I'm trying to say? We never put each other down. We never fought each other. One time we had a fight. Other than that, we, me and him lived in harmony. I see families and I see them, and they close to me. They can't make a week without cussing somebody out. You know what I'm trying to say? So I, I was wondering that, that everybody kind of respected each other. All right? And then I got a brother and sister, and I have never had an argument with them. Never have me and my sister ever argued. Never have me and my younger brother ever argued. Not one time. I respect them. They respect me. 
But uh, I have to take that back a little bit of it. I don't know what happened when I was drunk. <laughs> I'm talking about the sober, the time I can't remember. You know? I, I, got a, I had a blackout space in there, too. You know? All right. Oh, this is very important. We alcoholics are sensitive people. Oh, my God. We are the most sensitive people on the planet. If somebody say, boo, we go into depression. You don't like to be talked about. If somebody hurt your feeling, you go moping it like a little puppy with a tail turned down, squatting away. We are the most sensitive people. You know, my wife used to tell me, she says, it be grown men in my office, six foot six, built like Hercules, and I say something to them, they bust out in tears. You say, what in the world? Why would he cry like that? All you trying to do is help him? Because he's sensitive. A lot of times people think that I'm rough on him. And I kind of jug at you a little bit. But I've been in this game a long time. If you don't, if you can't take what I'm dishing out here, you're not going to make it in the real world. When you leave Step Up and you get a job out there, you gone. You won't last a week, because they're not going alone with that crying and tears. When they pay you a paycheck, they're going to talk to you any way they feel and treat you any way they feel. And you're going to have to take it or go. That's the way it is. So this is like boot camp for you. This is a training. This is a job therapy program. <laughs> so when you leave here and somebody say something about you, and it ain't even going to be the boss. It's your peers. They don't want you there. They getting drunk. They trying to figure out how to go buy the stuff at the place to pass the urine tests. You in there clean and sober. You don't drink. They been there five years. You in the warehouse. They been there five, six, 10, 15 years. You been there three months. The boss hand you the keys. Say open up. Don't be too sensitive. They are on a tack, pit, pit bull attack. <laughs> That's what they are. I'm telling you what I know. They on pit bull attack. They ought to chew you up and spit you out. Pit bull don't spit you. I chew you up and eat you. <laughs> but the point is, you got to be able to stand it. And then you're going to need some spirituality. You're going to need them 12 steps when you get out of here. It takes... Some of us a long time to outgrow that serious handicap of being sensitive. <laughs> I ain't gonna do it. But some people, it's gonna take a lifetime. They evolve over. My my biggest thing is a lot of we are so sensitive that we become, and I have done it too, professional people pleasers. But I don't want to get my feelings hurt. I'm going to do this a certain way for this group, this a certain way for this person, this a certain way for that person, because I don't want to feel the pain. Inside of us is what you call a pain body. And instead of me feeling and allowing that energy to flow out of me, I don't want it to rip up. I'm going to keep it stuffed down, so I'm going to be this little character for this person, this character for this person, this kid is prefer this person, not even understanding that all I'm trying to do is control the situation. I'm a controller. And I play the game each way, not to hurt no one feeling. I got guys that go out on the truck. I talk about this every day. We don't want raggedy sofas. A sofa from here to that wall, 12 feet long, full of dog hair. We don't want it. It has to go straight to the dumpster. But in our business, if you put two of them on the truck, you might miss 10 pickups doing that because it takes up so much space in a box truck. Don't bring those sofas in. Don't think for one moment that the, the person who called you, the donor, do not know that that, dog, that German Shepherd hell is, is all over that sofa. That's why they don't want it. They hoping you come and get it so they don't have to pay nobody to hold it off. But you go in there, since you're so sensitive, you don't want to hurt their feelings. You bring it to Robert. 
<laughs> Common sense, now you know your feeling gonna get hurt. <laughs> right? You know, I'd rather just tell them keep your own ratchet sober. But people cannot do that, y'all. Yeah. They don't have it in them because we are so sensitive. Mm -hmm. The area about being responsible mm -hmm. or being able to say the truth, they can't got it. They don't have it. Sensitive, too sensitive. Worrying about what they think someone else gonna think about them if they don't take it. But not, not even the mind don't even allow you, your feelings don't even allow you to know that the people who give it to you already know it's trash. Now here's the deal. Let's take it a step forward. The sober is not, never is it in a prop, in a right location where you just pick it up and put it on the truck. It's usually down in somebody's basement do a little dough, you gotta twitch it sideways, and, or take the leg off the dirty dog and sofa, and bring it out. It been raining, slip and slide around the side of the house, falling. Then you gotta bring it up, your back hurting. You gotta lift it up and put it on the truck. And it was no good from the beginning. But by since you so sensitive, you couldn't leave it. So you're going to worry about how you're going to hurt their feelings or they hurt your feelings. Me, myself, my boss, and then the, the insanity <laughs> of the whole thing is, the boss, the company tells you, don't pick them up. Now, common sense would tell me, if my, I got permission not to pick up a raggedy sofa, don't you think my mind will say, no, I don't want to lift it anyway. <laughs> I don't want to lift a good one. <laughs> Common sense will say leave it. But in recovery, then they say, well, it's common sense become uncommon sense. sense. Yeah. But you think it, or the world think it's common? When it didn't went up, it's uncommon, Wayne. We do the opposite. We'd rather bring in the ragged one and leave the good one. <laughs> Long time to outgrow that serious handicap. They say it's a serious handicap. Go to the bread game, the bread lose, you cry. <laughs> they didn't cry to get that $80 for that ticket. <laughs> Win or lose. The player don't even cry, you cry. <laughs> that's sad, that's just sad. <laughs> they get a couple drinks and you cry and throw it up. <laughs> and get a DUI. <laughs> Boy, that's bad. Let's keep going. Give, give the next paragraph. Many alcoholics are enthusiasts. Many alcoholics are enthusiasts. They run to extremes. At the beginning of the recovery, a man will take as a rule one of two directions. He may either plunge into a frantic attempt to get on his feet in business, or he may be so enthralled by his new life that he talks or thinks of little else. In either case, certain family problems will arise. With these, we have had experience galore. Oh, this is deep. This, I see this every day, all the time, especially with newcomers. That's what we're talking about now, newcomers. Many alcoholics are enthusiasts. That's, that can have a strong, excited feeling over something. You know, to, to be deep in and just, just, oh man, just, God just gave me this, woo! I'm in awe. Ah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm enthusiastic about it. I'm ready to go. Many of us are like that. They run to extremes. Taking off. Taking off. <coughs> you know, it's kind of like, let me see if I can explain running to extremes. Um, you ever seen a football game, Little League football game, Little Kids? And a guy, uh, Let's say they down on, the, uh, on one end of the field, and the little kid gets the ball. He, they do a fumble. And the kid picks the ball up, and he starts running, and he start hitting the crowd, but he's so happy to get the ball because he never had it before. Then he turns around <laughs> and runs back down on him. <laughs> and he, he jumps over, and everybody says, no, 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 no. <laughs> and he jumps over the, uh, he goes, the, 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 the goal line, you know what I'm saying? And he get in the end zone, touchdown! 
No, fool. I touch back. You went the wrong way. That's what they mean by running to extreme. We got the ball and we never had it before. And boy, that feeling. Go to run. They're running the wrong way. Or, or, or you see the ball player, the little kid, they run and get in the end zone, they keep on running, hit the wall. <laughs> like, where you going? All right. That's what we do. They run to extremes. At the beginning of recovery, remember, listen to this, y'all. A man will take as a rule one or two directions. When you just come into recovery, less than a year, Two years, less than two years, I, I extend it because some time in here. It's one or two ways you're going to go. You're going to go to the left or to the right. Just remember that. We're going to break them down. We're going to get one to the left and one to the right. All right? These are plunge. That means to dive, to fall, to jump in deep into a frantic attempt to get on his feet in business We'll call that the left side. Or the right side, he may be so enthralled, that means by his new life, that he talks of things of little else. So enthralled means like slave, like in slavery. In bondage, gripped or hypnotized by this 12 steps, this recovery stuff, that he thinks of little else, less. A little else, else. So here's the deal. So when you first come in recovery, you got to be honest with yourself. Where are you? Am I going too far to the left that all I'm thinking about is financial, material gain? And it's okay if you are, because we're going to break it down. It's okay to think like that. Or is, are you only thinking about recovery, the 12 step, meetings, you know, trying to sponsor, Running a lot of meetings, you're either going to go one or two ways. There ain't no, ain't no in between when you first come in. <clears throat> in either case, the family problems will arise. Now, I got to tell you about me. When I first came in recovery, I went to the right. I didn't go to the left about money and finances. I knew, this is only me, I knew that I could make money. But I had made money before. You know, I have seen in my checking account before when me and my brother had a company, $150,000 in the checking account. You know what I'm trying to say? A $250,000 check. But I also see myself running to the dope man too. And staying in the bar all night long. You know, spending other folks money like it was mine. Just because you see a big amount of money in the bank and you own a company, it ain't yours. You know you got them bills to pay. You know you got them taxes to pay, right? So I knew that, and then I had I had the, the pleasure and the honor of getting a check for forty thousand dollars and blowing it in two weeks. You now that was a blessing in disguise. Looking back, but that put me in recovery, not thinking that I had to chase for money. I didn't have to go look for a lot of money because I kind of wrapped my mind around the point that all money did was got me high. It helped me to get drunk early. So I didn't need no money. So I took the other route. You know, that just did a little job to pay my bills so I could stay in recovery. But I was a fanatic fool on the other side. I was crazy. I was so much into the book study, especially when I found out about the book. You couldn't talk to me. Unless you was a 12-stepper. <laughs> I, I mean, this, I was in St. Jude working on my fourth step. Guys are just coming in treatment or something like that, you know, just kicking in, walking on the highway. Hey, good morning, Robert, how you doing? Don't say nothing to me. What step you on? <laughs> <laughs> you ain't on your fourth step, I don't talk to you. Okay. I go back to my daughters and back to my mom and my house and my family now. If they want to talk in 12 steps, I wasn't going to stay. I was going to a meeting. This is nonsense to me. Y'all not steppers. Bye. <laughs> but it's the same thing I did in the military. I was, if, if you want to uh, 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 have a higher rate than me, I didn't want to talk to you. That's my, all my ego. 
So you bring that flair in the, in the recovery with you. Right. You bring it with you. It's like, you know, I always do this, and I'm going to respect the book, but I got to say, you bring that residue with you. Remember that part there, all that residue? You push it and flip it? Well, when you come and recover, you know, you clean this up, you bring all that residue with you from that past life. It's still here. So I went, so I was so bad that I had watched some of the professional fellowshippers. Now, this is really bad. You take a guy like me who was studying the book, learning so much, and around the meetings then, they weren't sharing about the book. They were just open sharing all the time. The book wasn't even discussed. When I started talking about obsession and the phenomenon of craving, they thought I was coming from China. I was talking a language nobody knew. It was right in the book. So when I started studying, my ego started getting big. And I would go to meeting, and I had watched the professional one before me. Every professional fellowship has a style about him. That when he speaks, he sounds like, uh, uh, I'm not going to say God. Uh, Morgan Freeman. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say? Like, he over there mouthing, boy, you know, it's like, whoa, that's Morgan Freeman there. Yeah, everybody know. That's how they are. Uh, it from God, but I ain't gonna call him God. But I will call him a Morgan Freeman. You know, and it be so profound. So, and I will study these guys right now, six months later, I see him relax, walking down the boulevard. But they were profound. So I had gather that style too. You gotta have it, you know what I'm saying? If you professional fellowship, you gotta have your own style, yeah. Steve. You can't go in that shit, <laughs> nobody. Not in the one we were going through, like the paychecks and some of them big ones. You better have a style or shut up. <laughs> so I had grabbed my style, and one of them was the, I wouldn't sit down. I mean, a hundred people now. <laughs> and the other one, they were sick about it. Me and my spot seat. And my two spots see, but all, two, all three of us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Derek on one side and Billy on the other. <laughs> and wait not to let everybody share all the stuff we thought was garbage. <laughs> we had no respect for what they were going through. We thought it was garbage. This is, this is going to the extreme. And we'll sit there, right? And then nobody will call on us. They get sick of us coming. <laughs> and then, or, they had a little, uh, what do you call that thing, hourglass? Yeah. The little minute glass? Yeah. So they weren't using it nobody else. But when we got ready to share, they flipped it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we were standing back to share, right? And then what we were really doing, and my sponsor brought it to our attention, it was like we were soldiers with them bazookas. The law gun, remember the law? It's like we carried the law, and the law gun, which is an anti-tank weapon, we would carry on our, as, you know, invisible, a spiritual bazooka to blow people away. Somebody say something wrong, we cocked it. <laughs> Put it up and start sharing. Boom! Blow them out. Hurt their feelings and everything. And we didn't know, we didn't even read the book far enough to know that alcohol was sensitive. We just had big egos. But we read more than everybody else. So I was going to the stream, to the stream. And then my sponsor would tell her that if you can't do it in love, don't do it at all. That's kind of broken. So we started sitting down, listening to her. Well, about a year, I stopped sharing. I just started listening. Because I, I was feeling that that wasn't right. You know what I'm trying to say? And then when bought, my sponsor brought it to our attention, because I went on and told him what we were doing. He said, no, nah, y'all got to cut that out. If you're not helping, then don't go. All right. But it took some time, because I came in with that ego stuff in me. Then when I started learning, it, the ego grew instead of the spirituality. Mm. So, and I see people do that for money. They come in here, everything got to be about money. It got to be about this business and that business. And, and what all I'm trying to say now is you got to have some kind of balance. You got to have some kind of balance. I'm not saying either one is wrong. No, this is not a wrong or right. And spirituality is not a wrong or right. But you better know where you are. If you're chasing out money, before you're chasing out the, uh, 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 a recovery, you're on the wrong track. And if you're taking out the recovery too much, that you're neglecting your finances, you're still on the wrong path. You gotta have some balance. It says that we have had, had it with these, no, it says that in either case, certain family problems will arise. And I get the recovery problem, 
But if you're in your families, you're going to have problems if you're going either way. With these, we have had experiences below. Do the next one. And one sentence, I'll do it. Then we're going to stop and start right here. Just remember, if you're chasing so much that your mind is enslaved to making money and starting businesses and stuff, and you don't have your recovery grounded and stuff like that, you need to pull back a little bit and practice the farmer's law, the farmer's principle. It's in season. If you so much that you teaching the 12 steps and you haven't even done them yourself, you need to step back. <laughs> Because you're sharing, and you know it. You know you ain't did no, this is the sad part about it. You know you ain't did a good, complete fourth step with your sponsor and a fifth step. But every time you go to a meeting, you start sharing about the fourth and the fifth step. You know the principle of truth is not in that. And then one thing you do, look, I've done some step sharing about step that I hadn't done too. And I had to walk out and say, damn, why you keep lying about that? You know what I'm trying to say? We do that. All of us do this. Share about stuff we know ain't right. You, what come out your mouth ain't what, what your ass is doing. <laughs> you know, and you got to say, whoa, this ain't right. I need to stop doing this. You know what I'm trying to say? I need to pull up from this. So, and that's a good, that's a good though. That's a good thing. At least I'm telling myself to stop instead of wanting to go on. So I used to say, well, Next time I'm going to do, I'm going to take this week, I'm going to run, and I'm going to get that step down, I'm going to work it, and when I talk about it, I won't feel so bad. I got a little bit more. At least I got the knowledge of doing it. I had no experience because I ain't did it long enough to, you know, if I work a step, you got to live a step. At least I worked it. I, I ain't going to be in that line no more. You know what I'm trying to say? And ain't nobody on my side, on my voice, I don't care what country you in either, you done told some lies inside the room about what you working on. <laughs> Because you started working on the hour before you came into the meeting. <laughs> 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 now you a saint. Come on now. Here's what I want to end up with. We think it's dangerous <coughs> if he rushes headlong at his economic problem. That's the key word right now. If you're doing something and you have a passion for it, and you love what you're doing, I wouldn't call that an economic problem. But if you're trying to repair something and fix some things, you know what I'm trying to say, and make some stuff happen and you're moving too fast and you know it's taking away from your recovery, then that's an economic problem. All right, thank y'all for a good meeting.